Hi guys, I'm Phil Town from Real One Investing and today I want to talk to you about whether or not I think there's going to be a stock market crash in 2021. So you all know the market fluctuates, right? We, we say it runs in cycles. It goes up, it goes down. Um, strangely, if you were to look at one day in the stock market, those cycles minute by minute look very much like the stock market if you look at it for 100 years. It's just the nature of a market to be somewhat volatile. And the problem that we have as investors is that while we would love to have a crystal ball and be able to you know, look into the future of these fluctuations, um, we really can't. We, we can we can kind of get a rough idea about where the market is relative to some long time standards about whether it's overpriced, uh, you know, relative to um, the general market or the general economy that we have. Um, but whether or not there's going to be a market crash, that that is a really tough one. And I, I will tell you guys, I just been doing some research on uh, on some work by Jeremy Siegel, who is a professor emeritus at uh, Wharton. It's very good at doing value investing research. And he did this amazing thing where he put together a view of the rate of return of four different asset groups, the dollar, um, gold, bonds and the stock market. And he didn't do it just for like the last 50 years or so. He did it for the last 200 years. OK, 200 years. So from 1800 to I think he, he was doing this research like five years ago. So um, it the data went through like 2014, 2015. Now get this, when it turns of crystal ball, okay? If you'd put your money in gold in 1800, um, today you'd have a, a value of gold that would buy you $3 of stuff for every dollar you put in gold in 1800, in real terms, in real buying terms. In other words, it would buy three times more stuff than it did in 1800. Um, pretty cool. So three, a $3 gain over 1800. If you put your money in bonds, you would have 15 or $1,600 that you would have gained over that period of time. Um, so substantially better than gold, right? Uh, 500 times better than gold level of return by putting your money in government bonds. If you put your money in the US dollar, it would have given you a dollar of 1800 buying power all the way from 1800 in almost a straight line to 1935 when the Federal Reserve started devaluing the dollar intentionally by printing more and more money. And they're continuing to do it in a big way right now, by the way. They've just over the last few years, added another 35% to the M1 money supply, which is just 35% of all the dollars ever created just happened. And so this is really astonishing. But let me just tell you what happened since 1935. The dollar went from a dollar of buying power from 1800 to a nickel. So right now it's lost 95% of its 1800 buying power which is an extraordinary loss of value in the last 80 years. Loss of real buying power. Um, so here's this this asset that is like the most risk free asset that you can have, according to a lot of people, which is cash. But turns out in the long run to be an absolute disaster because of federal government policy. I'm not criticizing the policy. We've become wealthier and wealthier as a result of this policy. OK, I'm going to criticize the policy. The reason we become wealthier is we've taken advantage of the fact that the dollar is the world's reserve currency. And after World War II, the U.S. had collected most of the gold in the world and agreed to back our dollar with gold so that you could exchange the dollar for gold at any time. And we withdrew that promise uh, in 1971 and refused to hand over gold in exchange for dollars because we had so badly taken advantage of our European allies and the people around the world who are holding dollars that we couldn't possibly give them the gold. It would have wiped out all the gold in the United States by multiples. So we have basically printed our way to wealth 
Um, and there might be a piper to pay for this down the road. So it's something we should be thinking about. I'm not going to go into it deeper right now, but just be aware that that problem is hanging out there in a very major way. So the dollar down uh, 95% since 1935. Stocks delivered. You sitting down? Uh, oh, by the way, real estate. They, Siegel didn't do real estate, but I did. I took a look at real estate from 1900. If you just paid full price for real estate, right? Don't, you don't leverage it. To, so it's apples to apples against these other investments. Um, real estate would have produced a return of slightly less than gold, just a little uh, better than about two and a half percent yield since 1900, which, you know, I know a lot of you are astonished by that because in the last 20 years, real estate has rocketed, but it's rocketing with, um, with the res as a result of a lot of Federal Reserve action and dropping interest rates. So it's a, a little bit of an aberration here about what's going on in the last decade or so. Um, over a lot much longer period of time, over 120 years, real estate's basically stayed a little bit above inflation in terms of real buying power um, if you don't leverage it. And then so finally stocks. OK, so we have real estate and gold just about the same bonds, 500 times better than either of them. And then stocks, which since 1800 produced a real return above inflation of one million dollars. So if you had a dollar in 1800, you put it in stocks, 200 years later, you have a million dollars in real buying power, not in just, you know, inflated dollars in 1800 dollars. Right. You'd have a million dollars, <throat> which would make you just insanely wealthy. So I think that's pretty interesting when we're talking about, <clears throat> you know, what's the market going to do? In the long run, you want to be in the market. The problem with the long run is that in the long run, we're all dead. The market can be flat for as long as 26 years in a row. And the more it goes up into really high levels of valuation, the longer it can go sideways in the future. Right now, we're at a stock market valuation or, or price, I guess you could say. That means that when you buy the S&P 500, which is the entire index, you're getting a 2.5% yield on your investment. <clears throat> you can do that by putting your money in a government treasury bond. So you, you kind of wonder at this point in time, why would I take the extra risk of being in the stock market um, if I don't have 200 years, if I've only got 20? Could I be putting my money in in like the equivalent of 1929. And the answer is, yeah, it, it's entirely possible. You, you, anybody that says no, keep your money in the market in the long run, it all turn out great is making money on you somehow. That's a sales pitch. The reality of the stock market is that in shorter periods of time than 200 years, there's a lot of volatility. There's a lot of risk there. And it's interesting to me that um, as good an investor as Lee Lu, basically phenomenal investor, look him up, L-I-L-U. Um, he's compounding money at 30% a year. I've talked to him about him a couple of times. He basically says there is one and only one way to generate consistent, real, high, reliable rates of return. And that is to do value investing. And he's researched every kind of investing you can do. And it's turned out that if you are, are are going to put your money in the stock market, you're going to expect volatility and you need to be investing in a way where you benefit from the volatility. You you are anti-fragile in the words of uh, of uh, Nicholas Taleb. So the market does cycle. It goes up and down. Absolutely. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, my crystal ball is pitch black for for 2021. I'll be real clear with you about that. But we are sitting at a Wilshire GDP of 200%. I've never seen that in my lifetime. That means the market is priced over double what a typical market price to GDP would be. Um, we have a new a new group that is now controlling Congress and the Senate and the presidency that is intent on raising taxes on corporations by 30 percent, which will reduce the earnings of the S&P 500 by about 11 percent, it's estimated, um, which means that P.E. ratios should come down and that could start a tumble. Um, we could have more COVID. I mean, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong. There's also all kinds of things that can go right. And the market is shoveling. It's just sloughing off all of this violence and, and craziness that's been going on um, 
as we as we about to shift from a, a, a Trump presidency to a Biden presidency, it's sloughing it off like it's not even happening, like it doesn't even matter. And it's doing that because a Biden presidency with the Senate and the Congress is very likely to be literally printing trillions of dollars um, and getting that out <clears throat> into the hands of the people who need it the most who will be consumers, who will be buying stuff. So there's a very different sort of money ethic um, in the Democratic Party right now than there was in, in, in Obama's administration in 2009, where the, the best and the brightest thought the best thing to do would be to put, you know, save the banks, put the money into the banks and make sure that they were liquid. And the expectation is the banks would lend it. But number one, they also passed a law that says you have to hold much higher reserves so they had less to lend. And second, the banks were scared to lend and they increased their standards of lending massively after the defaults that they had taken on subprime mortgages. So all of a sudden, you couldn't get a loan to save your life. I don't care how wealthy you were for a while there, you couldn't borrow at all. And then gradually, you know, they made it available to people that had, you know, 800 credit scores. So the money just sat in the banks. It didn't get out into the economy. One of the biggest reasons for a big, long, slow, you know, crawl out of that recession. Well, they've learned their lessons and now they're like, hey, put $2,000 each in the hands of everybody who's making less than 190,000 a year or something. And we will see that money come into the economy. So we're going to see a huge wave of cash come rolling into the economy. Of course, someday that is going to result in higher rates of inflation. But right now, that's just not the problem they're worried about. The Federal Reserve has guaranteed they're not going to raise interest rates to 2023. So man, everybody in the stock market is just looking at the stock market. You know, they all look relatively short term the next quarter, the next half year. With interest rates being held this low, all of a sudden the market looks like it's super cheap at almost any price you pay for it. Even at a 2.5 cap rate, it, people are going to be putting money into the market. So there's an argument both ways, you guys. I, I can't tell you for sure. I'm just going to tell you this. There is one and only one way where you can be very, very confident about investing in this kind of a market, and that is to learn what Lee Lu calls value investing, what Warren Buffett calls value investing. We call it rule one investing. We teach it and you need to learn it. E even if what you do is just learn it from the books I've written, from from uh, the books about Warren Buffett, from writings of Warren Buffett um, and some of the best value investors in the world. Just dig in, you guys. There's an entire education out there and we'd love to teach you, of course, at our company, <clears throat> you know, rule one investing. But, you know, don't feel like you got to come to us. There's there's a lot of ways you can learn this. And I think the, the more you learn, the more you'll want to learn. It's a, it's a phenomenal, interesting, fascinating thing to become a really good investor. And a couple of things I just want to point out that you really want to learn. You want to learn, number one, that you'll be buying parts of a business, um, not just stock shares or pieces of paper. It's literally parts of a business. And therefore, you want to understand that you kind of reap what you sow. You, you want to buy a really good business It's going to be around for a long time and you want to buy a business that matches your values. Let's let's get our values on the table here instead of exercising money like it's something that doesn't impact values in the world. What you put your money into supports the value of these companies and they get stronger. So what you put your money into as an investor gets stronger in the world for the next 20 years. And if you just put your money in mutual funds, you guys, they buy everything, you know, the whole market. You put money in an index, you're buying the whole market, everything good and bad and the karma that goes with it. All right. So we want to be sure we understand we're buying a piece of a business and we own that business and we should have, have karma related to that. The second thing is that we need to be sure that we have a nice margin of safety when we buy this this company. It's got to have we got to understand the value and we got to buy it when it's cheap. Now, I just told you that this market is extremely expensive. There's only been three times. This is the third time in history over the last 140 years that we've had uh, cyclically adjusted P.E. ratios up in the high 30s. The other two times the, the market has crashed massively. Once was 1929 and the other one was 1999. So we we understand that we are looking toward some kind of major correction here. But who knows how long that'll take to manifest itself. So you just want to be sure you understand what you're buying and be patient until you can buy it with a margin of safety because, you know, you could make a mistake and you want to be sure 
that you know there's ups and downs in life and you want to have a nice big cushion there so that you don't lose money so that's the number two thing and the third thing is you got to be sure you focus on your circle of competence be sure that you are really good at whatever you're buying i mean you don't have to be good at very much right there's 10,000 companies out there you, you need to be good at three or four of them and start with one and dig in very deeply on that and this is called Buffett calls it the circle of competence the key thing about this circle is to know where it is in other words know where the edges are by understanding that really important thing is to know what you don't know and that's all that's a hard for a lot of people right I mean it's really difficult to know what you don't know I mean I don't know if I know what I don't know all the time, but I try to know what I don't know. And so, you know, you got the circle of competence, you got your margin of safety, you got your stock as a business. And finally, you've got this incredible concept that Mr. Market, the market as a whole, is not some amazing fortune teller that can tell you the value of every business every day. It's more like a person with a manic depressive problem who sometimes is on their meds and sometimes isn't right now I can tell you for sure it's not on its meds today mr. market is irrationally exuberant pricing the market um, adjusted for inflation below the price of government bonds which is pretty much crazy so massively irrationally exuberant and then sometimes the market, Mr. Market, you know, gets off the meds and he's completely depressed. And then he's going to price things at prices so low that it's like he doesn't think the sun's going to come up tomorrow, even on wonderful businesses. So what we want to do is just be patient until the mood gets to be depressed, where there's all these companies on sale and then buy the ones you've created on your watch list by doing some some reading. Right. And then. Be sure you stay within your circle of competence. So that's it. It's, those are the four things right there. You've got margin of safety. You've got a circle of competence. You've got Mr. Market as a tool to use who serves us by giving us ridiculously low prices and then being willing to buy from us at ridiculously high prices. And then finally, that um, you're going to buy companies, not slices of stock. If you guys stick with that kind of stuff, you're going to do great. So I'll tell you what. Uh, I'd love to hear from you guys. I, I'd love to get the, the market opinion from a lot of people here. Do you think that the market will crash in 2021? Maybe as a group, we can figure this out. Leave a comment below with your answer. I'll be sure to follow up with you. And thanks for watching, you guys. Now go play. You guys, if you enjoyed this video and you think it was valuable for teaching you more about the potential of a 2021 market crash, just hit the like button here and please share the video with your friends. And if you want more investing content, subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the button on the screen for a free gift. And thanks for watching.